All right, Dom. What's next? Please tell me that's not a Pontiac Fiero strapped to a rocket engine? Impressive. I know. No. No, that's that's not impressive. Damn. They got a magnet plane? Nice clubhouse. A. B. N. It's headphone steel! What's up guys, Headphones Neil here, back with another film review, and in this case it's going to be the 2021 sequel, Fast 9, or I guess as it's on the IMDb page, F9, The Fast Saga. So, um, in this particular review, it's going to be relatively quick, just because if you've seen any of the Fast and the Furious movies, then you kind of know what to expect, and it, this one kind of aims to resolve a couple of things, namely um, normalizing the events of what we saw, learned and saw in the first three movies and then kind of even out or progress what we've been seeing in the movies since then, so the fourth one through the eighth one. So the story kind of serves as a direct sequel to the previous uh, Fast and the Furious movie, number eight. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head the naming scheme for that one, but we continue to see that Cypher poses a problem to um, the global threat. They're trying to steal a device called Ares, which is a continuation on that progression of the storyline for what we learned about what Ramses was and the introduction to uh, Natalie Emmanuel from Game of Thrones and her character. But this film... Um, notably does one thing in that we finally get to see um, the backstory for Dom um, going to jail, the death of his father, and what happened in that event and storyline back in the day. Um, so that I thought all of that was actually good and we finally get to see what all happened there. Um, so my only problem with the scene is that the modeling or characters or whatever they did to um, de-age uh, Vin Diesel and John Cena, I didn't really like what they did because those characters didn't really feel like younger versions of the two actors. I think they or what they I think they used the voices of the characters, which was fine. So you get the, a little bit of a disconnect, or at least I got a little bit of a disconnect as to um, hearing their voices but seeing characters that didn't really fit the model of what we would imagine as Vin Diesel and John Cena in their younger years. They kind of had a little bit of a facial structure going on but for me I just had trouble throughout the film whenever they did a callback to those characters and the scenes of them in their younger years. So I was glad that they that was kind of a minimal part of the movie so once that all was done i was fine and once we're up to present day the characters had looked similar enough where to the point where i could see vin diesel uh jordana brewster and john cena as part of a similar or part of the same family so overall that worked for me as their older selves but their younger selves generally just didn't work for me so with that out of the way, overall the film was fine. If you, like I said, if you watch the other Fast and the Furious movies, then and you've enjoyed them, then you're gonna enjoy this movie as well. They kind of are progressing the whole notion of bigger and more grandiose schemes of what's go, what you can do with a car. So in this case, the idea was twofold. You have Dom in the muscle car. Um, latching onto the bridge rope and swinging over to the side so they can he can save himself and Letty. So that was if you watch the other the past few films and when you have you know Dom and Brian, I think it was jumping from one skyscraper to the next. This kind of works in the in the scope of the films as far as reality. You're kind of losing all of that stuff so there is that but that was okay i was kind of like okay well if you're gonna have a um random plane doing a magnetic pickup of a car um notably the one that john cena was in then 
Dom can pull this off, so that was all fine. But the big jump the shark moment of this film, which I guess they're going to continue to do, was attach or welding a rocket to the back of a car, which I was kind of hoping would be a DeLorean, but I guess wasn't, so I'm calling it the knockoff DeLorean. But welding a rocket to a car and sending it off to space while um, Tej and Roman are in... Um, diving suits so that all was pretty crazy they have both boosters i guess with which allow them to break through the rocket and they somehow still survive so the car is reinforced i guess um so all of that was the jump the shark moment for the this particular film but overall i liked it if you check your brain at the door and don't worry too much about the physics of it and i kind of thought this scene was funny at the end when the lady the um, astro actual astronaut lady asked why they, there's minions in space, so all of that was good. Um, so with that, um, that's really all there is to say of the film. I mean, if you've seen the last one with um, what's her name, um, Charlie Strawn as um, Cipher, then this is a continuation of that with her continuing to want to take over the world and rule the world. Um, I liked. In this particular film, I particularly liked um, Tyrese's acting as Roman with the whole they might be they're immortal and potentially gods and all of that. Um, Tej's and um, Ramsey's his interactions with him and continuing to mess with him and all of that. Um, the only other thing that I really want to say that was kind of weird um, and one, another check your brain at the door kind of moment was the whole use of the magnets. So when they're driving through the city and trying to stop the tank thing and they turn the magnets on and off my whole thing was if magnet that it seems like magnets um only affect other vehicles except for the one you're in so it felt like a more of like plot armor i guess that wouldn't your own car be become more magnetized and have more dead weight and be affected there but it didn't really seem to be affecting anything at all so that all kind of um messed with me as far as what was going on so i just thought that that whole scene like the whole like sending the car into space with the rocket was fine because you knew when once um the guy from tokyo the guys from tokyo differ um introduced that they were gonna do something to pay that off but the whole magnet scene was for me was just like they kept you or i guess if they had only used it a couple of times or sparingly i would have been okay with it but they continued to use it turn the machine on and off so it just felt like there was a continued use of something that didn't affect the main character so it kind of served as plot armor to allow for people to continue to um to, or for them to continue to progress the plot the film and all of that so um with that the final two things was a bit that was something i actually had to look up so when they when we were introduced to the guys from um tokyo drift um my first thought was wow little bow wow has gained some weight but apparently um looking him up they recast little bow wow with somebody else so my biggest the big the, th the issue that i thought i had was wasn't the issue that actually happened so i guess they couldn't get a little bow wow in the film or maybe he aged out of it or didn't want to do it or they couldn't get a hold, a hold of him or whatever so um um that's a, one of those things to notice so i'm glad i kind of looked that up um so with all of that um and i guess reading some trivia i guess he supposedly is back but then um and actually i'm going to um look something up really quick as i check it out but um the only the other thing that i learned is i guess han's full name in the film is han solo and it's s-e-o-u-l as in this uh city and then dash oh but i guess the filmmakers had a little bit of an easter egg to, as a nod to han solo in star wars so just a little bit of a tidbit tidbit that i didn't know about the film so i thought that was pretty nifty um and i guess his full name shows up in um some screen as far as his profile on one of the screens when the group is looking up what happened happened to han so um and I'm going to actually retract what I said. Um, I guess 
Bow Wow's real name is um, Shad Moss, and that's actually him. So the biggest issue I had with that was, I guess, his character gained weight. So throughout the film, whenever they showed um, him as Twinkie, that I was like, that I don't know. That just I just thought that was kind of strange. So I guess I'll take back that he was recast, and they were actually able to bring him back. Um, so. As far as the film, I mean, just about everybody's in the film. So you have Kurt Russell back as Mr. Nobody. You have Helen Mirren back as Queenie, um, the lady who plays um, the transporter guy's mom in the past couple of films. And so just about anybody. And so you know, Ludacris is back. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez is back. Lucas is back. The guy who plays Sean in Tokyo Drift. Um, so everybody, and then of course Jordana Brewster. Um, so everybody except for Paul Walker, who of course passed away. But I guess there was a nod to him at the end of the film with the blue car that shows up to the barbecue. So I was thinking that they're going to pull off maybe one of the um, two guys from Dom's crew from the first Fast and the uh, Furious films. Um, um, I'm gonna pull up their names as I talk, but uh, maybe one of those two, uh, crew guys because as a tie into whatever they do in um, Fast 10 or F10, whatever the next um, uh, Fast and the Furious film is called, um, and maybe they're driving the car as a nod to him, or maybe they we learn maybe or as they continue down to. Um, bringing up family members that we didn't know existed, but maybe they bring in uh, Paul Walker's brother or a guy to play Paul Walker's brother, and they use um, Paul Walker's actual brother. Um, so I was thinking originally that potentially that they bring back maybe Chad Lindbergh as Jesse or Matt Schultz as Vince as, uh, to tie in and use one of those characters as a nod to using um, Paul Walker's character or to, to uh, just as a nod to um, Paul Walker's character in that car or something like that because I guess that was Walker's actual car. So if I was to grade the film um, by itself I'd probably give it about a grade of a B to B minus. It was okay. Um, as an action flick, but since it requires heavily on knowing the characters and having watched the prior films, um, I guess for me, I'm going to give it more of a B, B to a B plus. Um, they're continuing to the whole idea of jumping the shark and doing bigger and uh, more grandiose um, um, stunts and things like that, but they're delving more, less into the racing or underground racing world and more into the underground criminal element but using the guys who can drive cars and get things done and becoming more self-referential as they go so for me overall it was i mean it was a fun time there's moments where you have to check your brain at the door like the rocket on the car um the st some of the stunts that they pulled but having watched the rest of the films you kind of expect that they're gonna do things that are more and more crazy so overall it works and i like that they're tying in various all the various characters in the film and the various story elements so it seems like they're gonna tie in any loose ends for by the next film so that any story that is unresolved can be finished up and that it's ultimately gonna the next film, I guess, is the fi potentially the final film, it, or even maybe if, um, the eleventh film. I forget where they're going to stop, but essentially everyone retiring and settling down to become a family, like the memes are indicating with uh, Vin Diesel's emphasis on family. So um, we'll see what they pull from here. But if my guess is right, they're going to potentially pull in Paul Walker's brother as maybe an adopted brother or someone that we i don't know it's getting kind of getting played out as far as the unknown sibling of one of the main the main cast uh family but potentially um even sean the guy from tokyo drift could be in that blue car as well i guess so one of those things where um um they basically just tie up all those loose ends and have the main cast retire to raise um, Dom's kid and um, 
uh, me as kid. So that's all there is for this particular review. So if you have any questions, comment, feedback of your own, something I missed, uh, something you liked, disliked, or anything like that, you can find me on Twitter at PatelN01. The website is HeadphonesNeal.Reviews for past episodes, subscription links, supporting the show, and all of that good stuff. And of course, the Patreon is patreon.com slash patelN01 for supporting the show, getting bonus content, early access to upcoming content, and all of that good stuff. But thanks for tuning into this particular episode, and until next time.